Hey everybody, welcome to the Dog Wellness Revelations live stream podcast slash podcast. Um, look, we uh, we have a big show and we're really excited to be with you this Saturday. Um, I want to introduce first and foremost my guest, uh, my guest podcaster and live streamer, co-host, He's a, a real renaissance man, a veterinary surgeon, and oh, by the way, he is the father of raw food, Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Uh, I'm awake and alive, uh, upright, more or less, in a sitting down position, but uh, yeah, ro ro roaring, ready to go. You're but slightly you reclining. Marvelous introduction. Um, not sure any of it's true, but we'll stick with it. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, I, I'm I'm cool with embellishing. Is there anything that you do you do badly? Oh, ask my wife, and she say being a husband, I guess. <laughs> All right, I'll put that in the next in the next introduction. Uh, and it's with uh, great pleasure we introduce our guest today. Ronnie Lejeune is the founder of Perfectly Rossum, and she is a dog nutritionist. nutritionist and she and Ian, Dr. Billinghurst, are going to get a little nerdy with you today about dog nutrition. So welcome, Ronnie. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Good thanks morning, for being Ronnie. Here. It's morning for you guys. Didn't even catch the time oh, zone yes. differences. Yes, it's um, just after 7 a.m. Oh, Eastern okay. Australian Standard Time. Wow. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, Sydney. I'm I'm in Colorado. So it's uh, it's just three on Saturday. It's 7 a.m. on Sunday for him. <laughs> yep. Right. Yep. Well, listen, we're really excited to have you. So thanks for spending some of your Saturday with us. Um, I, you know, one of the things, I have a few questions for you, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Billinghurst does too, but, you know, what, let's start with this. What got you, you know, into dog and pet nutrition? My past dog, we recently had to euthanize him back in May of last year for cancer quite suddenly. Um, but he's the reason that, that got me into canine nutrition. I got him around nine years ago. And at the time, which I still have my border collie, he was three years old at the time. And when I got the, this dog in particular, his name was Loki. And I switched him to the dry dog food that I was feeding, but nothing I fed him worked. It got to the point where he was consistently having loose stools, um, bloody diarrhea, demodex type uh, dermatitis all over his body, um, yeast infections in his ears. We were just constantly in and out of the vet, and the vet clinic. And it do logically doesn't make sense that any dog should live through those symptoms. Um, and while they're just treated, I wanted to fix the problem. And at the time, that's when you, uh, Yahoo groups were, a th was a thing. Um, and I stumbled upon raw feeding there and I just dove head first into it. And within a month, my dog was having dramatic changes and I was sold and I pushed myself to get educated. So I self-educated and gone, gone through Companion Animal Sciences Institute so I could get certified and actually learn the in and outs of the nutrition side of it so I could do it correctly. Because, um, of course, I didn't want to inadvertently make my dog worse because already he was in a bad way to begin with. Um, so I owe everything to my past dog, Loki. He was an American bully, and uh, we sadly don't have him with us today, but I owe everything to him. Perfectly Rossum would not be what it is today without that dog. Wow, wow that is that is an incredible story. Um, Ronnie, I'd like to say to you straight away that I, I have been a fan since I discovered you, so to speak, on um, this thing, wonderful thing called the Internet. And uh, I just dropped – actually – I'm not sure how I'm connected, but um, I see your posts come up and I have a quick look at them occasionally, not all the time. And uh, I think, wow, this young lady is doing brilliantly. I love to see it. And, and you're now part of a, a team of a, or a cohort of people on the net who are making my original dream of getting raw food out there. You are now a brilliant part of that team of people who are working to get people onto raw food. And so let me say thank you very much because um, none of us uh, hang around forever. And um, 
you are carrying the torch forward brilliantly, let me say. Well, I appreciate that. You set the stage for all of us and and having your work work as the foundation for us to just conti continue moving forward is really excellent for us to help pet parents. I feel like now is a big turning point for just feeding our pets. And it's really excellent to be able to have your work as a foundation for what I do and build upon to help with my clients and the dogs that I see today. Well, you're certainly building upon it. And um, I must say, when I, when I started this journey, the reason I wrote the book was so I would never have to talk about it again. <laughs> Ironically, uh, I built the website for the same reason. And that simply does not work. No. When you introduce us a topic like this, the questions, the invitations and everything just pour in. So tell me, do you get to uh, lecture around the place or is it all done through um, through the through the website and through the computer? I've done a few in person workshops, but nothing to the extent where I traveled intent with the intent to speak. Um, most of it has been online through podcasts or just through my work. So we do have an online group as well. And I will host lives through that group where I could give my members the opportunity to ask questions and things of that nature. Um, but that's the extent of it. I would really like to get into <clears throat> traveling to speak. I do travel to compete with my dog. So I'm always on the road anyway. <laughs> that's great. Right. Um, so, so your dogs in in what area do they compete what 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 is that all about so my only sport performance dog that i have at this time is my german short hair pointer and what we do is we do akc foot footstep tracking scent detection dock diving barn hunt and just i am also a certified canine fitness trainer through the university of tennessee so he is my demo dog for any types of canine conditioning programs that i have to help develop for my clients um, and things of that nature so do you get a lot of questions um well tell me about the questions the type of questions you get um through your website people interested in raw is it just about how to do it or do you get questions about sick dogs and, and perhaps remedies that you might suggest via nutrition? Yes, <laughs> to both. <laughs> um, so we have the group of pet parents that are just wanting to switch. They and normal healthy dogs, otherwise no, no complications there. But we do have an influx of very sick dogs that need help ranging from, you know, liver disease and renal disease. A big thing obviously is obesity that's one of the major things i do see a lot of as we get dogs that are severely overweight so formulating diets to help promote weight loss without sacrificing muscle um, is a big thing that we focus on as well okay what's the uh, most common question you get asked about just raw diets in general do you think oh that's a loaded question <laughs> Um, is there a common theme, a common problem, or is it just all over the shop? I feel like the most common thing is, is the pet parent is sold on the concept of raw, but especially here in the States is getting the veterinarian on board. So they'll often go to the, to the clinic for their dog's annual or whatever that may be. They mention to the vet that they are feeding raw and then the monsoon of lecturing occurs. And that's often what I find the most resistance on is then I'll get pet parents that abandon raw food because they were genuinely pushed away just by their veterinarian. And I find that's often very upsetting um, because I do try personally as a nutritionist, as well as through the business, try to connect with veterinarians to help promote that change if anything, if you, you don't have to be out there shouting it from the rooftops, but if you could have us in your back pocket to recommend to your clients, that's always excellent because pet parents are going to feed fresh food regardless. We want to just get them doing it correctly. Ronnie, I, you and I have very similar paths. Um, 
my first black lab buddy um, was the reason he's the impetus for relearning everything I learned about raw food. And that's going on about, it's about 22, 23 years ago. And that's when I first met Dr. Billinghurst. Uh, we did, um, we did old school phone consult back then, um, way, you know, way before internet got real popular. Uh, but I found out about him on the internet and, um, and then fast forward to more, uh, modern time, uh, my now dog Gussie was my inspiration for his gut issues were their inspiration for the company that I've now founded. And Dr. Billinghurst is a senior advisor for uh, Gussie's gut. So um, it's really interesting where, you know, they say our dogs are our best teachers. And, you know, it sounds like uh, that's happened for us both. I'm sure Dr. Billinghurst too. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you a quick question. Like what drives you uh, to do this work every day. Cause it's one thing to do it for your dog. And, you know, it's another thing to do it as a profession and, you know, wake up every day and, you know, hear the stories and try to work through some health issues with your clients. Oh, I guess maybe it's because I do like the, you get a lot of reward from it. So when you do see your efforts, being recognized by the pet parents who absolutely not only need the help, but want the help. And they take that and put it into fruition with their pet. They coming back and giving you that tap on the back, you know, my dog's doing excellent. And, it, and that could range from he is, the stools have been regulated to, wow, my dog's blood work for his kidney enzymes have decreased. So it could range on the spectrum from, from getting positive results on a medical front to just quality of life improvements for our healthy animals. And I think just that in itself gives me motivation. Um, also, because I'm so invested in the internet, um, the, the uh, raw feeding industry in the internet, if you will, seeing the incorrect or the poor advice kind of pushes me to help give that foundation or the solid ground for pet parents to stand on so they could actually create a diet for their pets and know that it's coming from a science-based approach, not just this haphazard put together thing and hoping, crossing our fingers for the best. Yeah. Right. Running the, um, I am just wondering to what extent as you talk to these people, do you learn from them? Tell me about that. Oh, I feel like I've learned a lot um, in terms of having to pivot my approach because I get a lot of clients that ask me what I do. And I am quick to say now that I am not the person to follow in my footsteps because I probably do things in terms of feeding my dogs that not many people are comfortable with doing. Um, a, tell me about that. That's interesting. So I've, I will purchase live animals, process them from live animal to farm, like farm to table kind of situation. Um, and I know a lot of people can't tolerate even the thought of it. Um, and I've done it and I've, and not just small, animals like rabbits and chickens, I'm talking about large goats and things of that nature. So we've, I've done that. Um, I've also, I feed whole prey. So the actual head to tail, like a hare or a duck um, with the feathers, everything still intact. And I find a lot of my clients are not on that, that level <laughs> to be yeah, able that's to, me. to stomach that. <laughs> that's me. Yeah. yeah. I think that's amazing. And I, <laughs> I only wish I could do that, but yeah, I, I wish it could be like a, a, a real recent kill, but mine are frozen and defrosted, uh, but they're, you know, pretty close to whole, but yeah, that's, that's commitment. I, uh, I applaud you for that. Well, Ronnie, that's the way I started out because I was an agricultural science graduate, a young man of 22 let loose in the bush with a gun <laughs> <laughs> in the Australian bush. And there were rabbits everywhere, and that's what we were we were hunting, both for the family and and for our dogs, as it turned out. So I was I was a, an actual killer back in those days, doing um, 
doing the whole thing that and i'm not sure whether you do this personally or whether you have somebody do it for you but uh, i was doing that and the feeding of the dog side was irrelevant what happened was that as an agricultural science graduate out in the bush skinning rabbits and uh, pulling out their intestines and uh, what have you i thought wow i would love to be a vet <laughs> <laughs> And actually do this in a more constructive way. Anyway, um, so that's 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 how I began. But then later on as a vet, of course, um, and, and that's a whole big story, I realised that what I'd done back then was the correct way to feed our, our dogs and cats. But I'm, I'm with you on the point that um, people who have pet rabbits are not that keen on feeding rabbits to their dogs. No. No. And no. especially if it's whole and it has the face, it's the face component. It's always the face component. Of course. But, you know, and of course, the eyes and the brains are so important. Uh, right. Why yeah, that's why I'm, I'm a big proponent of feeding whole prey and doing head to tail when possible. I'm very fortunate for the location that I live in. So I'm in South Louisiana. This is hunting territory at its finest. I personally don't hunt, but my family does. And they also have connections to to farmers. So my connections to getting these items is so easy for me, for me not to take advantage of it. Yeah, that's crawfish. I, do sorry, I? Do you, I'm sorry. Do you feed crawfish? Oh, no, I do not. If I'm going to no. pay money for crawfish, that's going in my stomach. <laughs> uh, is that the same as crayfish in Australia? Or Similar, lobster? I believe so. Or yeah. Lobsters are the big ones, so prawns would be yes. similar to shrimp, I believe. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, now, there's something else just ran through my mind, but it's disappeared. Oh, I know. You're, so when you're feeding whole prey um, to your dogs, they're eating the intestines on the contents? I leave it all intact, and I give them the opportunity to choose themselves. And what do you notice about, for example, the dogs and their choice of say intestines and intestinal contents apart from the liver but the actual gut contents with the ingester so if i'm feeding whole prey rabbit to my short hair pointer and my border collie they'll eat the whole entire thing and to be fair this is easy to surmise because if i'm going out in the in the woods with my pointer he's he's eating rabbit poop <laughs> Excellent. already so if he's gonna get whole prey he's gonna eat the whole thing anyway um my past dog loki that we did have to euthanize he was a dog that selectively did not eat the intestines and i always right. thought that was interesting what what sort of a dog was this american bully hmm wonder why he just didn't like them didn't prefer them and I, if you, you didn't need it, I'd, that in that situation, I was fine with it, whatever. Absolutely. Yes, you know, just pick course. it up and get rid of it. <laughs> or the other dogs will clean it up, what, whoever gets to it first. So when um, your clients ask you about um, eating poop, coprophagy as it's known, the coprophagic habit of dogs eating poo, what's your, what's your advice if they're concerned about it? So I'm also a dog trainer. So I try to look at things at a, two different facets, nutritionally and behaviorally. So one, I want to make sure that the diet is what I would consider balanced. Is there enough amino acids and protein and fat in the diet to make sure that the dog is not seeking out other animal stools to supplement its current diet? Um, and then if we could assume that that diet is balanced. The next thing I start to look at is the dog's behavioral lifestyle to see if it is a um, obsessive behavior. I've worked with dogs that were stool eaters because of OCD type problems. So I need to rule out that as a differential. If those two things are not something of my concern, I generally tell them that it's just a dog being a dog. <laughs> Um, dogs like poop. My dogs eat poop. I normally don't freak out about it unless I'm in the woods because I, I just I'm concerned with parasites. Um, so I don't want my get my dog getting giardia or something nasty. But it's a very normal behavior. 
I don't concern myself if my dog is not being obsessive about it. And when I say obsessive, so past clients I've worked with is they've had multiple dogs. And when one dog is eliminating, the other dog is literally has its mouth open like a soft serve into the mouth. Wow. So that's, that's OCD type behavior. And we do want to fix that on a behavioral side of things. Um, but in terms of just a normal, healthy dog eating rabbit poop, out in the woods, I consider that normal. And I really don't freak out about it. And now getting my clients to be on the same page as me, <laughs> that is um, another challenge in itself because I, I feel like there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance with that. Now, Us yeah. humans feel like we should not be eating stool, right? That's unsanitary and not healthy, but we have to separate a human component from the species that we're speaking about. Now, Ian, I noticed you were laughing when she was talking about that OCD behavior. Why, why, why are you laughing at that? Well, one of my early experiences with dogs as a veterinarian were these large breed dogs who were fed dry dog food and not to the exclusion of everything else. And as it popped out, as they, they were eating the dog, dry dog food at one end and quite often they were literally almost at the same time pooping at the other end, these large voluminous stinking mounds of dry dog food feces but they would then turn around and eat them almost in preference and i think actually in preference to the dry dog food and i realized that back then that what they were doing was actually uh, eating a food that was more healthy at the back end than the one at the front end because it was the living bodies of bacteria high in um, obviously in probiotics high in uh, fiber because it was the high fiber in the dog food in the first place, um, but also rich in essential fatty acids, a lot of vitamins, the B vitamins, vitamin K and so on, rich in bacterial protein. So it was actually a better food after it had been through their intestines. And that combined with my understanding of um, the fact that dogs were coprophagic, that they, they did lick each other's backsides and drag out of toilet bowls and all those things, I, I realized that the microbiome component of the dog's food was something we should include. And I had a great deal of, pro of a problem because I knew that introducing raw food, well, actually, I didn't realize back then, but I wanted to introduce raw food to the world, partly because I wanted to stop talking about it, as I mentioned. But I also knew that this was difficult. This component was difficult because most people would not accept that the dogs actually like to eat rotten and revolting food. For example, they, they dig up bones. And just recently, Rob contacted me and told me about his product, which is raw fermented vegetables, which he then actually turns into a product. And I said, this is a great idea. This is, is the greatest improvement now that, because I hadn't been able to do this. So we recommended yogurt and kefir, found the dogs didn't always like sauerkraut and uh, that sort of thing. I thought, wow, this is great. We are now going to feed more of this component as part of the overall diet. So what do you think of that sort of a supplement for dogs? Can you tell me what you think about that? Oh, I'm a big fan of fermented foods in any type of way we could get healthy bacteria in the gut. So it is one of my protocols I do use for stool consumption. Dogs who are quite obsessive about eating stool. Um, so I'm a big fan of all the fermented foods from dairy based to soil based types of ferments. And that's, that in itself is a whole rabbit hole. You could go down on the types and all the different ferments available. Um, I do, I did look at the supplement and I'm excited to try it. The only downside is that I'm going to have to get my husband to put it in my dog's food because it has the alfalfa and I'm deadly allergic to it. So I don't oh, wow. want to, <laughs> I oh, don't wow. want to start freaking and sneezing in the house. So he's going to have to give it to the dog. <laughs> well, the good news is uh, the future formulas we have planned, they, uh, not all of them have that. So that'll be good. But yeah. Oh, that's excellent because I could definitely use, I, I would use a product that I could touch more frequently. <laughs> yes, right. That's, that's very important. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, oh, um, yeah, I did. For, for the people, and you know, just like, just going off of what we, uh, how we started, which was, you know, Dr. Billinghurst talking about, um, <clears throat> 
how, you know, you've taken the mantle, you know, the torch and run with it, as they say, and, you know, inspired uh, this. He's inspired you to do your work. How do you see yourself inspiring others to, you know, to get into pet nutrition, dog nutrition, cat nutrition? Um, tell us a little bit more about what you do day to day, you know, what your actual, um, you know, career is like doing that. Oh man, it's a heavy load to carry. Um, I feel like a lot of people do not realize the amount of work that goes into maintaining a website like Perfectly Rawsome. Because I do, there's a there's something within the business model that I, I feel that's true to my ethics and to my core. And that is to always make sure that the content to, to feed a balanced diet is available to you for free. And making sure that that content is updated and constantly available is a task and of course keeping that new content relevant so we are constantly trying our best to at least publish one free article every month and we just recently launched a membership program to where you pay for specific types of articles and these are the more tailored types of nutritional articles so like right now we recently released content for home cook diets and then now our we're sh i'm shifting focus to writing content for sport performance dogs and their specific nutritional needs for optimal performance and then we'll dive into things like therapeutic diets and things of that nature so we try to do a membership uh paid membership article every month as well so we're ideally we're publishing two articles a month on top of helping our, our paid clients for our custom meal plans and our commercial, um, oh, I'm losing the word, consultations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then of course we do have our, pay, uh, our free group, Raw Feeding University on Facebook, which is our very, very large group that we do help manage. Um, and that it, of course is a job in itself. So there's a lot of moving parts keeping perfectly awesome going and staying relevant because of course i could publish this content and just drop the ball and just back away of course people will eat it up and still use it but giving more content and helping push the movement further is quite important to be able to help keep it relevant and keep people interested um i do find that our raw feeding university group helps drive my content because I'm there actively seeing the problems people are having, the questions they're asking, um, and how they're responding to the content is also important. Um, cause, so we're also going back on very, very old articles and trying to remaster them based off of the activity and uh, behavior we see through our pet parents and people who use that content. My goodness, Ronnie, I'm exhausted listening to that. <laughs> It's amazing, but you do have youth on your side. I and try, youth. and I, I will say I'm very excellent at time management because I'm also a dog trainer, so I'm, I'm training dogs on top of all this, and I compete with my own dogs. Yeah, I, <laughs> I do a lot of dog stuff. <laughs> have you trained your husband to assist you in all this? Oh, I haven't cracked that yet. <laughs> so if anyone in the comment section has the solution to that, I'm all ears. Well, that's, that's amazing. amazing. <laughs> well, speaking of the comment section, you have a very uh, lively commenting, uh, some very, very serious comments and questions coming in, which is awesome. Um, so uh, let's let's go with the well. We have a couple comments, which I'll I'll try to reserve to the end. If we don't have time, we won't be able to share them. But uh, let's first go with um, a question from Joe. So. Just as how do you figure the bone content ratio for the different meats? So I know Ian is going to have different opinions about this than myself because <laughs> he does ratios much different than I do. Let's and hear that's it. Okay. I calculate based off of the percentage of bone within the raw meaty bone. So there's edible bone and that's found in raw meaty bones. So meaty bones are the meat the bone, the connective tissue, the fat. And it's the 10% ratio that you hear the golden rule for, for, and I use that for adult dogs. And that's a guideline. And I always say to pivot based off of your dog's stool production and consistency. Um, we always want 
firm stool, but consistent at, as well. Um, because if you feed raw, too much raw meaty bones, you can make a firm stool, but it's going to be inconsistent and quite constipating to your dog. So you want to make sure that we're having consistent and firm stool. Um, so for adult dogs, I do the 10% ratio and that's 10% of the overall consumption of the diet. Um, so we have to calculate how much that dog is consuming and we calculate 10% of that. On my website, I do have a lovely chart of all the bone percentages yield yields for raw meaty bones, and it's ca uh, categorized by protein type. So you could go say like chicken feet, and you could find the percentage of bone there. And in that article, I have a calculator there to help you do those calculations for you. Wow, well, Ronnie, I've got to get hold of that. <laughs> Well, I certainly don't disagree with you on, on the adult dog. That's all they require. Young dogs, of course, right, require much more. a whole lot more. Um, right. The prey model is absolutely, if that's what people are working off, suitable for adult dogs. But dogs, because they are scavengers, as young pups, they need a lot more bone. And, of course, um, I don't get quite so worried about the ratios as long as they're getting plenty of uh, raw meaty bones i found they do just fine however i'm not going to argue with somebody like yourself who is doing so well and doing such a great job because what you're doing works perfectly fine <laughs> there are i believe many roads to rome and um i'm an old fossil who has some old ideas which i think are still okay but um, I'm still in great admiration of your work and the information you have obtained and you're putting out. So well done. And uh, I say to people, you're not going to go wrong if you follow Ronnie's <laughs> advice. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, we do use a higher bone percentage for puppies. So I've redone the 80-10-10 model. And when I published that, Oh, I want to say that was maybe four years ago, four and a half years ago, my revamped per ratio percentages for puppies. And I feel like it broke the raw feeding in world in on the internet because everyone told me I was going to break dogs. It's way too much bone, especially for giant breeds and all this crap. And essentially it's, if you just follow it, I have a large breed. My German short hair is a really large pointer for the breed standard. And I followed these guidelines that I wrote myself and he developed beautifully and we had no pastern problems, which is what everyone was worried about. The dog's going to knuckle over because it's too much bone and all this stuff. And I'm, and I, I feel like there is a disconnect um, with understanding that the body needs extra calcium to develop bones. If we do not wow. provide those cal the calcium, those bones simply won't develop. You know, Ronnie, it's, I, I find it amazing that people don't understand that um, dogs in the wild don't have Excel spreadsheets or computers. <laughs> Yeah, that too. <laughs> and yet they still develop beautifully. And the reason is very simple. And um, homeostasis, it's called, where the body has developed in conjunction with raw food over millions of years, dogs' bodies, our bodies, in a particular nutritional environment. So long as you supply that environment roughly in the ballpark figures of what they've had over millions of years, that body takes what it wants from that food and does what it needs to do and discards the rest. But that only works with real whole raw foods of the type that particular species right. evolved to require. And it's that simple. And um, that's one of the reasons I really started out saying to people, my goodness, this is so simple. And it remains simple so long as you follow those evolutionary norms. And so whether you're recommending whatever that ratio is, the golden ratio to an adult dog or something different, most of the time it doesn't matter because it still works because of homeostasis and using the right foods. The only caveat on that is young dogs need more bones, particularly, well, just young dogs, whatever, whatever breed they are. And um, I too had the joy feeding my ratios to my Great Danes and uh, Rottweilers back in the day, and they too grew beautifully as right. you discovered because the body 
knows what to do with real whole raw foods. And isn't, isn't that wonderful? Right. And I find myself put, positioning myself in the middle ground. So I, I accept the, the data that we have available to us on food. I also accept that there's just some data that is just non-existent. And I try to position myself smack in the middle and I give, I always fall back on my past dog as an example um, and the resources I have available, available to me. I do have access to a lot of wild game parts, you, you know, like wild duck and geese and these rabbit pieces and the nutritional content of these parts just doesn't exist. And if we were to adhere to the mindset that we need to follow a nutritional guideline based off of the numbers on a piece of paper or an Excel sheet, I couldn't feed those foods. And it doesn't seem logical to me. I'm not scared of feeding food. And I try to implore and empower my clients and just pet parents to adopt that mindset. If you could liberate yourself from the concept of having everything so balanced on perfect on paper, the comfort of feeding food just starts to come naturally. Now I do always cross analyze my dog's diet to make sure that there's no holes, but I don't do this every day. <laughs> That's great. Ronnie, I th the thing I, you've used it, you're using the word food. And to me, that's the key. We don't attempt to feed what we know about nutrients because we don't know everything. But if we feed food and it's the right type and it's varied, and then we can't go wrong because food is what supplies the nutrients and it always has done. And it supplies the ones we know about, the ones we don't know about, and so on. So I think that's the sort of thing you're saying. But can I move to a completely different tack? Something I thought of earlier when you were talking about vets. Can you tell me, do you ever really find that you're able to influence veterinary surgeons to think more seriously and more logically and more biologically appropriately about feeding raw food? I haven't had the, the chance to know. A lot of the clients that I've been working with recently has had adamant pushback from the specialists that, that they're currently working with. And I communicate to my clients that they need to be completely transparent that they are working with me. I do not want to have closed doors on the diet. So when they receive reports and everything from me, they have full freedom to give it to the specialist to prove that we are working to make sure that diet is appropriate for whatever condition we're working for. Um, so an example, I recently worked on a protein losing in neuropathy dog out in Canada. And um, the specialist is adamant about just feeding fresh food in general. It doesn't matter if it's raw or cooked. And that was quite upsetting for me because, you know, why, why does it, matter uh if it's balanced but thankfully the client is seeing the light on the other side and she's still working with me and we gave her her formulated diets so now it's just her it's of course in her hands to feed her dog and we'll be in in touch to see if we get progress because the dog is not quite stable at this time um but i haven't had the opportunity to change any specialist at this time i wish i could um but i guess in time Enough what dogs about, and in time. <laughs> what about just your average, ordinary, day-to-day, -day competent garden vet, not the specialist? Do you, do you find that you can influence those through the results that um, come with feeding raw? Do you I've seen more raw? success with those, yes, with your common yes. vets. They, they, are, they won't say, hey, I'm going to recommend this to our next client, but they openly acknowledge saying, okay, I see you're doing it correctly your dog is healthy. I have nothing to argue at this point. Um, I know my personal vet had strong resistance in the beginning. And um, I think she did her research on me and was preparing to go into a knockout fight in, in the clinic. And I'm like, I'm not here for that. I just want to be on the same page. You're my medical practitioner. Don't worry about the diet. I will give you everything you need to know about his diet. Let's just move forward. If I'm in the clinic for my dog being sick because of the food that I feed him, then we could revisit this conversation. Let's uh, do a quick question from Brian Hantman on YouTube. Uh, can you talk about feeding whole prey to young puppies? We were just talking about 
puppies and bones. Um, what do you have for that? Uh-oh, we're, we're, we're pulling something here. My my computer is about to die. So oh, sure okay. It's well, charged. Not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like that's a loaded question because whole prey in itself is very variable. You have wild prey and then you have domesticated raised prey. And then some of that domesticated raised prey is also not fully developed. So something like feeder um, pinkies, pinky rabbits, feeder, um, I don't, I think they're called feeder mice or young feeder mice. I don't know the technical term, um, day old chicks and day old quail. Um, so these are undeveloped, underdeveloped animals. I have less, what's the word? I want confidence. To um, yes, confidence in those and whenever I want to feed that frequently. I'll feed them. I don't want to rely on that quite frequently. But That's really interesting because you just don't think they're, because they're underdeveloped, um, it's, not, it's not providing the spectrum of nutrients or... I think they're providing nutrients. I just feel like, especially when we're discussing a puppy, I don't feel like it's an appropriate food for that puppy. Interesting. If, if we want to feed prey, I would rather feed a fully developed prey animal. So whether that would be a whole prey adult rabbit, regardless of size, because that's variable depending yeah. on species. Um, same thing with chicken and, and duck. and But then that gets different when we speak about domestic and wild i feel like wild prey is the closest to nutritionally balanced food that we could achieve yeah um i wrote grow your pups with bones and give your dog a bone for the very purpose that we actually need to feed young dogs more bones and i went back to the situation of young wolves or any young animal in the wild competing with its parents for food and the parents of course eat all the, all the delicious stuff, and they often leave the bones till last. And that's what the young pups get to use. And so I always emphasize the fact that dogs are scavengers. And this is different to cats who do, uh, it, from an evolutionary standpoint, need to eat just whole prey. That's the, that's the way they've evolved over time. Dogs have evolved as scavengers, and young pups particularly have evolved to eat more bones than the adults. And of course, um, if you're feeding a, a young prey, say a young rabbit that's not fully developed, then the bones of that rabbit are not fully um, ossified. They don't have the fully, high, what's called hydroxyapatite, which is calcium phosphorus. So they don't have that. What they do have is loads of cartilage, which is great for the joints of that mm -hmm. young dog as it grows, but it doesn't have the, the um, sufficient calcium and phosphorus. So they need that balanced calcium and phosphorus from actual raw meaty bones. And this is what I've emphasized for a long time. And it's all hidden in the in the title of both those books. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. So feed, you would want to feed more a developed prey animal to a puppy. Um, and I often lean more towards wild game than domestic for obvious reasons, because then we could jump down the rabbit hole of the way that the animal was raised because that's all, always going to dictate the nutritional content of that prey animal you know if it if speaking of chicken in particular if it was raised in a cage and jammed up against 50 other chickens compared to a very a chicken out in pasture eating what it's supposed to eat bugs lizards frogs seeds nuts etc um i would argue that the chicken who is raised in its environment and consumes a diet it's supposed to eat is going to be more su su uh, superior than the other chicken, right? No question about that, Ronnie. But there is one other thing we have to think about. Um, as a person who's raised chickens, uh, or we call them chooks in Australia, <laughs> doesn't make any difference. When they reach an adult age, maybe they've been laying for two or three years and they've stopped and we've decided to turn them into... Um, what is it? Um, oh, I can't think of the French the French uh, word, uh, the French dish. It doesn't matter the way you use an adult chicken. If you cut these, uh, if you butcher, for want of a better word, these chickens, and you look at the bones, 
And you compare the bones of an adult chicken to that of a young chicken who's, just, well, maybe three months old, those adult chicken bones are like steel. Oh, yeah, they're so much harder. And they are dangerous, even, mm -hmm. even raw. So that is another component you have to think about, particularly for a young pup. And particularly a dog, a pup that's never had bones before, if they suddenly recognize, hey, mum's feeding me the best thing she's ever decided to feed me, and I try and gulp, you know, gulp this down, that could cause major problems if it's a mature chicken that, with those harder steel bones. So you have to think about other factors apart from nutrition. You're right, then that's very fair because I do always encourage my clients to feed food suitable for the dog size and age in question. So we wouldn't feed the same raw meaty bones to a chihuahua that you would feed to a Great Dane. It just doesn't yeah. logically work. And that was the same concept goes to puppies. Um, and then the age of the puppy and the developmental stage that they're in, specifically the mouth and the teeth. Um, and I always tell my clients, you know, under six months of age, we're dealing with puppy teeth. They're fragile. The development of the, especially if they're coming from eating dry dog food, their jaw strength is not even there. So we have to build that up using softer. We, we do feed raw meaty bones, but we'd have to feed softer ones because it's not going to happen with a, a denser, a denser bone, even from a rabbit. So we have to build that up. And then once those puppy teeth go away, and once we get those um, adult molars and premolars in, then the, the magic starts happening and you could start really offering some bones that the dog could actually crush and consume safely, depending on the size of the animal. Of course. Wow, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm learning a lot already. Um, I've been doing this a while. Uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, well, you know, because I, I you know, I, I, just as recently as my dog Gus, uh, you know, would give him drumettes. So those are the baby drumsticks um, of, you know, I'm sure younger, I'm, I'm sure not spread smaller, but just younger chickens. Cause when he was a puppy, I just thought, okay, small drumette, small puppy. That makes sense. Um, doesn't sound like it's the worst thing in the world, but it has, you know, it makes you think, you know, it's a very good point that it's, you know, an underdeveloped animal. I understand the, sm the soft bone thing too. Um, and then, you know, adversely, con or sorry, I should say conversely, you've got, you know, some animals, you know, like beef, if they're raised on factory farms, living on concrete most of their life, those bones are stronger than steel. I mean, those are really dense bones and really, really hard, as opposed to, you know, uh, to your point of like, you know, wild prey, um, ones raised on grass on, you know, on, in, in, uh, on ranches and, and such and roaming free, those, that bone density is very different. Yeah, and I, and I will say I am a raw feeder that does not feed beef bones unless yeah. they're ground. That they they scare me, they yeah. terrify me. Yeah, We've got a couple uh, issues, uh, questions about you know, everything from liver enzymes to IBD and uh, a couple and Cushing's disease. So let's let's uh, go to <laughs> let's go to a couple of those here. So first and foremost, we have Bob, I think you've opened Pandora's or we have opened Pandora's box at this point. Seems like. <laughs> I know. Let's let's go for it. Uh, so Charlotte Bryant uh, from Facebook. Hi, Charlotte. Thanks for your question. It says my IBD dog was saved by raw feeding. She loves whole prey. We do quail. But then she did a follow up and she said my internal medicine vet told me my IBD dog uh, irritable bowel disease that is would die if I fed raw. Very sad. As I've said earlier, it saved her life. Comments. <laughs> Can I jump in here? Yeah, yeah. I think you have more <laughs> footing for that. Well, well he's in Australia. No, it's harder to get at him in Australia. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> the only thing I want to say is that we, if you put this, this uh, specialist is a scientist, and in science, every proposal is a hypothesis. Nothing we can, we can say is actually proven. So you say to him, well, the hypothesis I'm putting forward is that if, if I feed raw to my IBD dog, it will get better. And your hypothesis is it will die. Well, which hypothesis 
was proven to be wrong. <laughs> and that's the science. That's, that's the science at its most basic level. And, and you know, in Australia, I say, mate, you're 100% wrong. Simple. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's, it's just these specialists who are, you have to understand they are trained by and for the most part have worked for pet food companies who have an agenda, which is to sell this terrible stuff. And this terrible stuff full of carbohydrates and lacking in nutritional balance and value is the cause for the bulk of IBDs, unless there's some huge genetic problem. And you take them off the cause and feed them something that will actually promote health and they get better. And it really is that simple without going into any details. This, you are, it's like saying, oh, I've got a car and I'm going to feed it the non-manufacturers, I'll get to give it or, 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 or um, replace all the manufacturer genuine spare parts with something that is El Cheapo uh, and not designed for this car and wonder why it doesn't work. And that's what we're doing. Our cats and or our cats and dogs are designed by evolution to eat a specific way. And if we disregard the manufacturer's instructions, we get into problems. And it really is that simple from my, from my perspective. I'm, I'm a very simple vet and I found that um, uh, I didn't like having to uh, diagnose and treat conditions that could be very simply remedied by changing their diet. I wholeheartedly agree with that. That and uh, when I am presented with a client that their specialist says the same thing, the only thing I could respond is is saying, "Well, you're here. We're going to get the diet right for the condition that we're needing to help your dog fix, or not fix, stabilize. That's a better word." Um, and let time be the teacher. That's always Absolutely. my response. Time's going to be the best teacher because once your dog is not going into the clinic or is their values are improving, the only thing you could say is, is that your original assumption about switching the diet was just incorrect and we're on the right path. And the right. problem there is, Ronnie, that the dogs that get better never often don't go back to the vet and they don't go back to the one that was giving the incorrect advice. And so that's... <laughs> That vet never learns. How sad is that? Yeah. Good yeah. point. Good point. Here's a question about Cushing's disease. Um, Amber Detheridge from, on YouTube says, is it possible for a dog with Cushing's disease to be fed a raw diet? I think I know what you're both going to say. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the condition will need to be managed with the medications appropriate for Cushing's, but fresh food diet regardless if it's home cooked or raw it's fine great and if, if we're dealing with a tumor whatever we have to think about right. feeding a, a diet that is appropriate for that which is very close to a ketogenic diet in many instances but let me also say that i've seen many dogs stabilize beautifully and require much less drugs by just feeding what i would call a standard raw food diet and that applies to most disease problems the and that was what blew me away very early in my career simply by changing the diet most problems and a lot of them were intractable problems that were not being well fixed by conventional um, medicine or veterinary medicine and surgery was, would simply disappear when fed real food and that that's what got me hooked that this and i call always call myself a lazy vet because um I could watch a lot of problems just disappear simply by changing the diet and doing very little else. No, it's true. Very good. Well, let's move on to liver enzymes, shall we? Um, Tina Austin <laughs> in Facebook says, what do you think raw? What do you think about raw for high liver enzymes? Um, see, what do you think raw? Oh, raw for high liver enzymes doing well ultrasound showed nothing been like that for two years uh do you understand that question i would imagine that the dog's liver enzymes are high they recently did an ultrasound on the liver and this has been the the blood values for the past two years that's what i'm taking from that sure okay um i mean you could do raw for hepatic problems it depends on the blood work 
and how we would approach it. And if, if this dog's enzymes have been stable and high for two years, I would imagine that this is just the baseline for that animal. Um, because you can have high normals. It would, it would just take some time to compare all the blood work to see if this is actually a clinical problem that would result in a diet change. Um, from my experience doing hepatic diets, we need to make sure we reduce ammonia, copper, and we do some liver support supplements like milk, milk thistle, some vitamin E, omega-3 fatty acids, and such like that. Couldn't disagree with you, Ronnie. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, let's let's go on to uh, one more question about uh, Sharon's been so patient. She's, she's got this is a finicky eater question. So thank you, Sharon Coleman on YouTube. She says, I have a boy who picks out the organs and I found that putting them through the grinder and mixing them works. Um, that's your uh, statement. Right. Sharon, here's my question. Okay, here's my question that's about that. Um, Lisa Starshine says, is there any way to sneak in organs for a dog that does not like them? Is powder form of organs sufficient? So I'll address the powder form first because that's quick and easy. The powder, from my experience, um, is going to be astronomically expensive. So just abandon that concept. Um, the amount that you would need to feed in terms of the powdered supplements to meet the raw weight version of the liver, the kidney, whatever, is going to drain your bank account. Those supplements are incredibly expensive, just at least from the calculations I've done in the past. In terms of feeding, a, I call this selective eating because I really genuinely believe as a someone who works with canine behavior, that picky eating is often a created behavior from the pet parent. I do not believe dogs come programmed as picky eaters. Um, so if we have a dog that's refusing organs, I would want to strategically change how I feed. I would want to essentially teach how we do the concept with children. You eat your broccoli, you get the cupcake. So it would be kind of the same thing. We teach the dog, you eat your organs, you get the cupcake, um, we would need to identify what that cupcake is for the dog and use that as a reinforcement strategy for eating the icky thing and getting the yummy thing. And that's going to start to help develop a, a dog that understands that they eat whatever's presented to them and undo the picky behaviors that could have been developed from any type of coddling or adjustments to food because I've noticed a lot of pet parents when they put something down and the dog sniffs it and scoffs at it. What do they do? They pick up the bowl, go back to the kitchen and adjust it and do something to it. And then the dog is like, okay, I'll accept that right now. Thank you. And it becomes a revolving door and you put yourself on a slippery slope. Consistently, the dog consistently doing that is t actually training you to give him what he wants and you're creating picky behavior. So if we already are on that slippery slope, when we're dealing with organs, I try to adjust things quite simple um, without going quite dramatic. I've often learned that organs are a texture issue versus a flavor issue. So if you freeze it first, try to give it frozen solid. Um, so I've had clients, they'll blend it in a blender and they'll put it in ice cube trays and are these little cute little shapes, whatever but freezing it often changes the texture. It also decreases the smell. So the olfactory system from the dog is not registering it as really offensive as when it was in its raw state. So you could try it that way. The con I would offer it only by itself. So we would say at dinner time, you're only gonna get a bowl of this frozen organ first. The concept is for the dog to eat the organ and then you present the remaining of the diet. So then you're reinforcing the eating behavior with the, something the dog finds desirable. Now I realize that's a training aspect and not many people are ready to go down that road. The other opportunity is to like Sharon mentioned in her comment, grind it and mix it in the food. I've also had clients had success with they start to they cook it first and decrease the cooking over time. Um, if you want to cook organs, my best recommendation is to do sous vide because we could protect it. 
without it damaging the proteins and the, the nutrients within, within it. Um, and then over time, just decreasing the cooking and then offering it to the dog. Just a really, um, a really low temperature sous vide. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I'm not aware of what is sous vide. So it is the food is placed in a bag and is vacuum sealed. So you essentially just take all the air out and it's submerged in a, a water that has been temperature regulated. So you'd want to get it to the temperature you, you want the meat to cook at. You'd submerge it and it stays in until the meat itself matches the temperature of the water. Okay. And then it's, it's in that down. vacuum sealed bag. So it holds all the moisture and the nutrients yeah. inside of it. Very good. Look, I agree with everything you say. Very simply, for me, many dogs who are fussy eaters are just being overfed. And a little bit of hunger works wonders. For, for yeah, many I'm a big dogs. fan of intermittent fasting. Yeah, because um, we just have, as you said, a dog that is very good at training their owners. And some of the best dogs are the little dogs. They're very good at training their oh. owners. <laughs> and I learned a lot about picky eating because of my border collie. So yeah. he's 14 now and um, at adolescent male intact border collie. If anyone owns a border collie, they know that they can be quite difficult to feed because they are often engrossed in their environment, hurting behaviors. They have better things to do. Um, and I learned a lot through him. Now I've never been a, an, a dog owner that catered to feeding. It was always the food's down. That's what you're getting. I'm not going back in the kitchen and doing this circus act for you to eat. <laughs> but he was the dog that pushed me to really think about the training that I needed to do to teach him to eat things that he was just like, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, we had a border collie, George, and uh, he often was doing that. But then later on, he would sneak back and eat it when we weren't watching. <laughs> and I can assure you, my dogs are not anywhere close to being overfed. Um, they're heavily exercised. So exercise is a great appetite stimulant um, on top of um, making sure you're not overfeeding your dog. I often recommend just go exercise your dog. You'll be quite surprised if you offer something after exercise. Absolutely. What uh, what do you speaking of that? Uh, I recently, Gus is five, and I brought him into the vet, and he's heavily exercised, and you know he looks really lean. He's got a really pronounced waist, and he's a Labrador. Um, and you know I like talking to my vet. He's a great vet about you know people say sometimes he looks thin, and my vet said to me, he said you know. Do really healthy dogs should be built like coyotes. They should look like coyotes. What is your view on that? If someone's not telling you that your dog is thin, your dog's likely overweight. <laughs> Good point. It's Great. true. Society is used to seeing boxes on four legs. And I am very, I'm obviously I'm a canine fitness trainer, so I'm very strong footed into making sure we have dogs at healthy weight. Um, so if, you, if someone's telling you your dog's thin, your dog's likely at ideal weight. And, and what do you feel? Cause you just mentioned intermittent fasting, which I personally do. And I believe in for my dogs. What do you feel about fasting days? Like, do you do one a week? I don't do forced fast because the dogs that I have now, I cannot do. So my border collie is on pain management. So I feed him twice a day with his medication um, cause he's, he's 14, his hips are starting to really be full of arthritis. So he's on some pain management. So I feed him twice a day because of that. And then my pointer, the sheer amount of food that he consumes because he's big and he's my sport performance dog. I cannot feed him once a day. Uh, he's a bloat risk and I'm very concerned about that becoming a problem. He also has acid reflux problems. So I notice if I feed large meals, he gets really gassy and separating it into separate feedings is, is fine. Um, so for that reason alone, my current dogs are eating twice a day against my personal bias to intermittent fasting. <laughs> what, about, what about a day of fasting? 
I don't do that simply because I'm, so I'm a dog trainer. I couldn't fast my dog if I needed to train. I, I'm, I use a lot of reinforcement in terms of food. So I, of course, toys and social and inner, in, inner environmental reinforcements, but it's really hard to train if I don't have reinforcement and inner, and fasting is not going to really fit into that mold for me. Um, so I personally don't do it. I've recommended to doing a more gorge and fast type feedings to my clients who have Nordic breeds, mm. things, uh, dogs like Huskies, Malamutes, because they naturally start to fast themselves. So if we could put it on a schedule and track the diet, it's a lot better than the dog just, I'm going to fast for three days in a row and then decide to eat for three days in a row. Yeah, yeah, wow. Well, well over the years, I've um, had many uh, clients with all sorts of breeds of dogs. Once we switch them to raw, the dogs naturally fasted themselves because for the first time in their entire lives, they were actually satisfied and they were not eating a diet high in carbs that provoked insulin, right. which then provoked low blood sugar, which then provoked hunger and so on. So we didn't have that cycle. And we had some dogs, um, and I'm thinking of a Vishler in, in particular, that would only eat every second or third day once. That dog was absurdly healthy, had no problems of reflux or any of those things. And it was very active, was a, was a dog that ran miles every day, but would only eat. And, and this is in, in tune with the evolutionary background of our dogs, where they ate intermittently. And from that, when I say ate intermittently, there was no regular feeding times. Some days in the wild, a wild canid will eat lots of small insects all day, and maybe a rat or a mouse. Another day, they might have killed a large creature, so they will gorge on it. So I was from the very word go, and I wrote this in Give Your Dog a Bone, I don't think it's beneficial if, if it fits into your lifestyle style not to feed a dog at a regular time, but when it suits you because of your lifestyle, then that is absolutely okay. So this, again, a, a case where the dog is not training you and you're really not training the dog. You're just working <laughs> together with your natural rhythms. And that works absolutely fine. It's the way we uh, actually live. And, and I suspect the other part of that is that each meal you feed your dog, in my opinion and from my experience, does not have to be complete and balanced. And so this intermittent fasting, which is just a normal part of the dog's evolutionary background, I believe also that intermittent unbalanced diet is equally important probably for health. So the balance occurs over a period of time, right. but it doesn't have to occur at every meal. And all of that, I believe, is part because it's the way we, we they evolved. That's what leads to greatest health and longevity. And it takes a lot of the stress out of what you do if you can adopt that mindset where you look at evolutionary norms and say, I'm going to follow these because that's the way the dog evolved. Perfection I wish yeah. I wish my pointer would choose to not eat as much food. <laughs> <laughs> he eats so much food. <laughs> oh, he's the I've never fed a dog as much as I feed him. He's 77 pounds and he eats um, o over 2000 calories a day. And that's a lot of food when we start discussing raw. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Can he tolerate yeah. more fat? <laughs> oh, to an extent. So um, animal fat is a trigger for his acid reflux. So oh. we are, we focus a lot on the plant fats. Um, yeah. So like when, when I say plant fats, it was sunflower oil, hemp seed oil, flax, those types of things. And then I, he has a heavy amount of fish in his diet and that regulates his reflux really well, but he is on a high fat diet for sport performance. And I have to just do specific types of fat because I've learned if I do anything like um, beef fat, um, he can't have pork or chicken, so he has some protein allergies there, that he gets burpy and his reflux gets a little not managed. So we make the choices to avoid those. <laughs> so, Ronnie, that brings up another important point that people who have dogs in their life should be, I'm sure if they have kids, they figure out what can be eaten and what can't be eaten and what causes problems and what doesn't. So 
people should have this mindset that they can actually fiddle around with these things and, and intelligently make changes and observe what happens. It's uh, They're not going to kill their dog by right. making a small change and seeing whether it causes a little bit more of this or a little bit less of this. It's just they've got to have more confidence in the dog's body not being as fragile as it's made out to be. It, it right. Can be, and, and just learn how to work with your dog. It's, it really is that simple. It all, it all comes down to not being scared of feeding food. Not being what, sorry? Not being afraid to feed food. It's Absolutely. Just, that's, that's really that's what right. it comes down to. Yes. Yeah, just food recently, just recently I, uh, I mean, I've never done this in two decades. I just started giving grass-fed butter to Gus. And, you know, I never even thought of it. I always thought, you know, ah, lactose. Don't give him, you know, I, I've told well, you hear a lot of things about butter online because it's going to cause pancreatitis. Meanwhile, it's just a really nice form of fat. <laughs> yeah, good, good quality butter. I mean, I think that's also the assumption we're working with, which is, you know, we're feeding healthy animals, healthy meats. You know, we're trying to keep, uh, you know, the products that are, you know, going in them, whether they're meat or vegetable, you know, as chemical free as we can. And you know, all of that fun stuff, right? That's obviously one of the assumptions we're making here. Well, we watch so many dogs with pancreatitis simply get better on a relatively low fat, high vegetable crushed and raw diet. And gradually, they, a lot of them can go back to a fairly normal diet as long as it's raw. Right. And raw right. fat is not nearly so provocative of pancreatitis as, as long as, and then it's not compared combined with high starch. Oh, got to leave the starch out. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but that's where a lot of, I think people have failed to make that connection. It's the fat's not the problem. It's combining it with the starch. Oh. That's the problem or the heat treated fats. That's yes. also an issue. And, yep. and you see, again, if you follow evolutionary norms, our, the ancestors of our dogs never attacked cooked wheat fields, ever. They had no stoves and they were not attracted to a wheat field that had been cooked or even raw for that matter. The cooked wheat field. It's kind of dirt, but I, you know, it's, um, it, it is, it is really very simple. Well, with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that note. And uh, first want to thank you so much, Ronnie. Uh, from perfectlyrawsome.com. Thanks so much for being on today. It was really great. I appreciate you having my me. thanks to that, Ronnie. <laughs> I know that, I, actually, I'm learning that our nutritionists should also be trained as our raw nutritionists. So listening to your talk, this is in even safer hands than I thought. Wonderful. Oh, well, that's, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh. It's like uh, it's like on the Great British Baking Show. You got a handshake from uh, from the. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. From uh, you're getting a handshake from an old guy vet who's passing the baton very gladly. Oh, I feel so honored. That's great. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us today and, and asking your great questions. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also go to gussiesgut.com if you want a free sample. We'll be happy to send one out to you. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Ronnie. Bye. Bye. Bye.